Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCullough. Thanks for joining me. It is September 5th, 2023. It is a beautiful yet very warm Tuesday here in Baltimore. We got a big show coming up. We're going to talk about these markets uh, selling off here on Monday after a nice rally last week. What is the next direction? And I got to tell you, the month of September typically is not the best for stocks, but maybe this year is different. I'll show you a couple stats. We're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about longevity. We're going to talk about AI and healthcare. How about oil? hitting a multi-month high. All that more coming up right now on Making Money. NVIDIA may be America's top performing stock after more than doubling this year alone. But if you're holding NVIDIA or thinking of buying it to get a stake in the $7 trillion AI market, you're going to want to see Mark Chaikin's new AI prediction first. Mark is a regular in many news outlets from Fox Business to CNBC and built the stock indicator Wall Street uses to find winning stocks. His award-winning system flashed buy on Tesla before it climbed 335%, Moderna before it climbed 300%, and Riot Blockchain before it climbed 10,090%. It also found NVIDIA at the start of 2023, before its massive bull run. But right now, Mark is stepping forward to warn people to stay away from NVIDIA. My system has indicated that NVIDIA is no longer the best stock to buy to profit from AI, is what Mark says. In fact, it just flashed buy on a totally different AI stock. And today, he'd like to hand you the name and ticker symbol of his number one AI stock to buy right now. For a limited time, you can get this information for free at www.aifrenzy23.com. Again, that's aifrenzy23.com for a free copy of his new report. Once again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 5th of September, 2023. As I mentioned, if you're anywhere in the Northeast and uh, maybe other parts of the country, my God, it's like melting outside. Uh, I walked out last night to get dinner uh, here in Baltimore a little later in the evening. The sun was coming down. I got to tell you, folks, it was it was insane. It, it was so darn hot. I felt like I was back in Florida. I got to tell you, the 88-degree weather almost all year round in Nicaragua is sounding so much better every day that it's 98 and 90% humidity here. That being said, the market itself was hot last week. We had a nice run in the market last week. But after a long weekend, I hope everybody had a great long weekend uh, and didn't work. You know, as I thought it was funny yesterday. I was uh, going through some uh, copy and, and doing some research. And uh, it was Monday, so I like to work, you know, five days a week, six days a week. But it was Labor Day. So they were supposed to take off. And I'm messaging other people in the company, and they're all on the computer. So finally, I told them, get off. It's Labor Day. Go enjoy it. The thing was, it was so darn hot out, so everybody was inside. So you pull up your computer. What do you do? You start working. But that should be good to see that we are constantly working for you here behind the scenes. But as I mentioned, we had a big rally last week, uh, selling off a little bit today after the long uh, weekend. The S&P, NASDAQ both down about four tenths of percent, half percent. Not big, uh, but I'll show you here in a chart. As you can see, here's the S&P 500. You can see on the right hand side of that chart, we did have a big rally in the last two weeks. And again, selling off right now, the S&P about 45 minutes in trading down about four tenths of a percent. I don't want to talk about the real short term right now, but I want to look more at uh, the month of September because historically, folks, the month of September is pretty damn ugly. And uh, let me show you here a chart. And this is going back and it shows how September is actually the worst month of the year. And I, I hate to tell that to you and be the bearer of bad news, but it is. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this looks at uh, the uh, the monthly returns of every month. And the uh, kind of orange looking, yellow color, whatever that is, since 1950, you can see here, September's averaged a down month. The last 20 years of blue color, it's averaged a down month. The past 10 years, even worse, down nearly 2% in the month of September. And then all the way on the right hand side is pre election years, which in the presidential election cycle, every four years, of course, uh, pre election, because we know the presidential election will be in 2024. So this is the pre election years. Uh, down again, about 1% or so. So no matter how you slice this ugly, smelly onion that is September, it comes back negative. And if you look at every other month, you don't see any of them that have really more than two. 
down. February slightly down over the uh, past 20 years in 1950. But other than that, folks, you don't really see it. And September is ugly. I mean, uh, ugly. I have a bit of a reprieve here that tells you, well, maybe this September won't be as bad. Uh, even though, again, we're having a down day today, but it's one day. We can look at one day. Here's a chart. Uh, this is from uh, Ryan Dietrich over at Carson Investment Research, one of our regular guests. Uh, this shows the S&P 500 performance um, in the month of September and for the rest of the year. But it, it breaks it down since 1950. It looks at years where the market was up at least uh, 15% heading into the month of uh, September, or sorry, month of August, uh, the first seven months. Uh, and then it looks where it has a negative August, which we had down 1.8%. So first seven months, up at least 15%. So obviously it's January through July, August down, and September, how does it turn out? Well, strangely enough, uh, of the uh, nine times that this has happened, it's been up eight of the nine uh, with the average gain and median gain both up 3.3%, which is a great gain for the month. More importantly, look at what September through December has done. Up all nine times, an average gain of 11.5. Now, are these just arbitrary numbers we're pulling out of the sky? Sure, I'll agree with that. But what this tells me is typically buying begets buying, meaning that there's momentum. And when you have a strong first seven months of the year, a lot of times you'll end that year strong. August seems to be a, a month that, that the market takes a breather. And what that means is we've gone up seven months and there has to be this month where we kind of say, take some profits, you know, can, this can't go on forever and not every month can be up. And I, I point to August as that month because it is the last month of summer. Typically, it's a vacation month. Typically, it's a low volume month for the market, which means when there's low, low, low volume, less liquidity, more uh, uh, big moves can happen due to that. And you see increased volatility. So it, it all kind of makes sense if you think about it logically. And um, so to me, boy, it's setting up like I think we get a rallying to the end of the year. I've been saying that. Uh, but again, September historically is a rough month. So here's a look at September going back to 1950, and it takes the average of every day. So it shows how the month typically performs throughout the, uh, that month. And you can see here, for the most part, between zero, uh, day zero, you know, obviously before September starts, through the 18th, uh, the market uh, is typically up slightly, about 0.3%, so not a lot. So you don't see any big gains at all, really, throughout September. Just go back to 1950, folks. And then it just tails off at the end uh, and down on average about 0.8% for the month uh, if we look back to 1950. So again, uh, all signs are pointing, in my opinion, to being a bit of a, of a rough month here in September. And uh, again, let's go back to that short S&P 500. We sold off in August. We rallied towards the end of August. And again, we're starting kind of in the middle of no man's lair in, here in September. Uh, but again, the big picture story here is uh, we still have a market that if you take away the magnificent seven, that big seven we've talked about uh, in the S&P 500, the valuations for the other 493 stocks out there, 493 of 500 S&P stocks, is still around 16 and a half, seven forward PE ratio. That is nowhere near bubble territory. As a matter of fact, it's around average for the last 15, 20 years. So we're not near any bubble territory. We're not setting up for a blow up because majority of the market is still poised, in my opinion, to rally. And we've seen that shift a little bit the last couple of months as we've had a bit of a pullback in the Magnificent Seven, the big guys that make up a large portion of the market cap of the S&P 500 and really of the entire market itself. And I think this continued shift to some of these small cap names, mid cap names will continue. It hasn't really started yet. And I think it is on the horizon that we're going to see that happen uh, very, very shortly. So that's where we stand right now uh, with this. And so based off uh, what's going on, maybe you take a little early fall, late summer vacation, mid-September. Because again, folks, look at this chart. Maybe this is time for you to take two weeks off. Go enjoy the fall weather. Go see your favorite football team play. Uh, before we jump into uh, to our second segment here, we're going to talk about housing a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about ARM. Uh, that is uh, the big semiconductor company that's going to be uh, going public here in the U.S. They came out this morning. They said they priced their IPO 
between $47 and $51 a share. Remember, Arm is majority owned by Japan's SoftBank. And uh, they filed here back in August to go public, and it will go public here very soon. Uh, but only 9.4% of Arm share will trade here in the NASDAQ. You do the math, that means 90.6% are still internally held by Japan's soft bank. So only 9.4% will actually trade. You know, they do, uh, they're a semiconductor company uh, and they sell licenses uh, to that uh, technology that they have architecture of chips. This is kind of crazy. Its chips are used by 99% of all smartphones. 99%. So you're talking Apple, Alphabet, which is Google, Qualcomm, which is in, in, in a lot of different uh, smartphones, 99%. It'll be interesting once this opens for trading, how this uh, stock will react. This may give us a good look into the appetite for future IPOs and the appetite for technology outside of the big seven. Another big uh, news story came out just this morning, just a couple of hours ago. Saudi Arabia uh, said this morning they're extending their 1 million barrel per day voluntary oil production cut until the end of the year. It was set to expire till the end of the year. This program was launched in July, if you don't remember. Uh, this cut, it, it's added to the 1.66 million barrels a day um, of the other voluntary crude output that some members of OPEC uh, have put in place until the end of 2024. Well, what did oil do today? Well, oil bounced about 2% this morning, up to last check, 87.30 a barrel. That's the highest level since November. So oil is moving. Let me show you here real quick a chart of XLE. Uh, and this is the oil ETF, a basket of some of the largest oil companies out there. Markets down, as I mentioned, this is up 1% this morning, trading at the PES level uh, going back to uh, late January and not far from a high up around 94 and change. And let me show you here, folks. Let me zoom out quite a bit on this chart. This would be the highest level if we break above that level since 2013. Uh, at a high is up around 101 going back to 2014. Um, sorry, sorry, 2014, being a hot source since 2014. Uh, I got to tell you, the way things are looking right now and uh, the way that I see things moving when it comes to oil and gas in the economy, uh, I think that this rally honestly could continue. And you, and you think about it, uh, when you think about oil, China's economy, people are worried about it, but it is – it's going to pick up again. It will. I mean, back to double-digit GDP growth, no. But it, it will pick up again. There's been some concerns with its um, property sector, and there are concerns there. Some of the biggest companies potentially going bankrupt. Uh, that being said, China's economy will continue to pick up, and the government will see to it, in my opinion. They will stimulate the hell out of it. And a lot of demand comes from China, so you will see uh, demand uh, really pick up. And again, supply uh, if OPEC and OPEC Plus continues to do this, whether it be voluntary or involuntary moves, uh, this is going to put pressure on oil uh, to move higher. And uh, I think I talked about this last week, but, you know, the EIA came out uh, recently and said that uh, power generated from solar over the last three years has doubled. Great. It still only makes up 2% of all energy consumed in the United States. Only 2%. Coal still makes up 8%. We got a long way to go for oil and gas becomes extinct uh, as far as power generation. A long way to go. So uh, I, I like using that barbell, that 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 energy barbell. One side renewable energy, clean energy. Other side petro, dirty energy. You need to have exposure to both for the long term. Let's talk about housing. You know, I, people keep talking about this housing bubble. I'm not a housing expert. I'm not a realtor. As a matter of fact, I bash realtors probably more than anything. Uh, all that being said, you know, I, I have to keep an eye on it. And I think there's a lot of investment opportunities out there. But let me show you a chart here that I came across this morning. And this shows the rent to income ratio and a mortgage payment to income ratio. What it shows is percentage of your income that goes towards rent, percentage of your income that goes toward, towards a mortgage payment. You can see here the dark line going across is a rent to income ratio. It's really been steady. It's moved a little bit higher recently, but pretty darn steady going back to 1991. So 22 years. That being said, the mortgage payment income ratio has taken off dramatically since 2021, uh, when really interest rates started going up means mortgage rates go up. The one caveat to this chart that I think is, is deceiving is this is if you're going to be doing that now, going to buy a house or going to rent. 
majority of people are locked in at interest rates or mortgage rates below 5%. So they're locked in. Their mortgage payment's not changing, unless they have some type of adjustable arm, but a lot of people haven't done that uh, recently. They've been locking in 30 years because a lot of them are below 4%. So you lock in, obviously, for 30 years. So this isn't affecting most people. So this is very deceiving. The rent one, to me, is a little more indicative of what's going on, and the rent one really hasn't moved much. So this isn't as negative, in my opinion, as many will say. Here's another chart we want to take a look at, uh, and this is the U.S. home prices. They're on the rise again. This is year-over-year -year change in medium home prices, according to Redfin. You can see they came down from August 2022 all the way down through May of this year and now picking back up. So home prices are going up. And again, that's going to lend to new people coming into the market because you're paying more for a home based on prices. You're paying more for your monthly payment based on mortgage rates uh, being elevated near 20-year highs. So, of course, that makes sense in my opinion. Um, so... You know, according to that chart, um, it's now nearly 1.7 times more expensive to buy a home than to rent a home. So what does that tell me from an investment standpoint? Everything to me, I look at, and how can we make money off it? How can we profit off this? Two things popped in my mind quickly. Um, was one, one was look for real estate investment trusts uh, that have exposure in regions uh, that are growing, people are moving to, and regions uh, where uh, you believe that the rent uh, is less compared to the home prices, where home prices have taken off and rent maybe has come up because it's more affordable for people to rent, so likely more demand for rentals. And if you own nice apartment rentals, that will do well. I would look at the states uh, in the South, Florida, uh, Tennessee, Texas. They all have in common one thing. No state income tax, and, and that's a real thing uh, for people like me who have lived in New York City, have lived in Baltimore, uh, states and cities with super high taxes. Uh, people who live in California, I don't know how the hell you live out there and pay those taxes. It's nuts to me. Um, that's one investment angle. The other investment angle is, well, if people are locked in at mortgage rates 4% and below, a lot 3% and below, you're not moving anytime soon because you're not going to buy a house that, uh, if it's comparable to you, is going to cost you more to buy. And also, if you're borrowing money, it's going to cost you a lot more to borrow. So suddenly, you're in a comparable house and paying a lot more money. doesn't make sense. That's why inventory is so low. I've talked about this in the past. So then I turn my attention to uh, home improvement stores. Lowe's and Home Depot, two big names. Here's a chart of both. Here's a chart of Lowe's. It's an okay chart. It's bottom last June. It's been going up. Uh, and here's a chart of Home Depot. Pretty similar. Bottom last June, been moving up. But there's nothing great about those charts. They don't look nearly as good as the overall market. There might be some opportunity there. I didn't dive into them. I just came across this this morning. It's the first thing that popped in my head. But if you're staying in your home and you know you're going to be there for a couple of years, maybe you add on that little addition. Maybe you redo the bathrooms, redo the kitchen, paint, whatever it might be. Put a new floor in. So I think home improvement stores will see a big bump in the coming years. Uh, also, on top of that, Home Depot and Lowe's get business from builders as well. And we need to build more homes. The inventory is too low. So they should get a double bonus from that. Those are two areas that I would definitely look at, folks, if you believe in what I just told you about where we stand with the housing market here today. Uh, next thing I'm going to look at is uh, longevity. And everybody who knows me knows I'm a big proponent of longevity. Uh, I believe that uh, people can live a very long life if you're healthy. Um, I try to live as healthy as possible. I will say it's much tougher, the fact I'm literally living out of hotels I uh, have for the last several weeks, and I will be basically until mid-November, uh, and it's tough. I've had four straight nights, four different days. Tough to eat healthy. It's tough to work out every day. It's tough to get a good night's sleep. That being said, those are three of the most important things you can do in life. So I got a uh, tweet here from Peter Diamandis, um, one of my uh, favorite authors. I talked about the book before, The Future is Faster Than You Think. It's a must read for anybody that has uh, any interest in the stock market, any interest in investing, and any interest in longevity and being healthy uh, and living a long, healthy life. Uh, this is a uh, tweet he put out yesterday, September 4th, 2023. So many people alive today will live past 120. Many people alive today will travel to Mars. The future is arriving very soon. Uh, this isn't guy just saying it. He, he has a, the studies to back it up. So I found some other amazing uh, numbers here. And again, there's, a, there's an investment angle to this. The U.S. Census Bureau, uh, they came out and number uh, centenarians, uh, 100 years or over, is projected to grow to 130,000 U.S. by 2030. 
Uh, and that's up from about 56, 60,000 last year, uh, the number, uh, the approximate number, and expected to exceed 600,000, 10x growth by 2060. Obviously, it makes sense. Think about where we were living 100 years ago, what the, the, the lifespan was. Much different now. And they kind of call it the graying of America because obviously, I got to tell you, folks, I'm starting to get some grays here in the sideburns. And I feel like in the last three weeks, the stress of traveling, I've gotten more. It's unbelievable. And if I ever grow a beard again, which I do for, from time to time, it is what they call salt and pepper, folks. It's it, it, The gray is inevitable. If you start seeing people in their 60s and they have black hair, they're probably doing something about it. The percentage of Americans uh, over the age of 65 doubled in size. It used to be 8% in 1950, 17% in 2020. And uh, by 2050, looking to be 22%. So again, the amount of people over 65 continues to increase. And, uh, you know, the AARP did a study, which is really an interesting study. You can, you can Google it. It's called the Longevity Econ Economy Outlook. Longevity Economy Outlook. And that believes that the older Americans over age 50, heck, I'm almost there. I guess I'm the older American almost, contributes $8.3 trillion of the economy each year, 40% U.S. gross domestic product. But by 2030, they believe that number is going to be $12.6 trillion. And uh, by 2050, nearly $27 trillion. What all this tells me is that there's there's investments and trends, not just a longevity trend, which is going to be more about the healthcare aspect of it. But the longer people live, it changes the way that retail is done because people in, in an older age are more active and you have to present them different goods and products than you would to somebody in their teens and 20s, which is always kind of demographic people go after, but you're gonna have a lot of people with more money. Look at the amount of money in different demographics. The older demographic typically has more money. They've worked their entire life, they've saved. Um, and a lot of them have had investments in the stock market that grew over that time. Uh, so it, it changes so many different angles of the overall economy, which then will affect a lot of the trends that we look at. Uh, money management, what am I money management firm? You know, the average age is probably 55 to 65, somewhere in there. Uh, if I had to do the numbers and uh, it probably will get older over time because people live longer. They have their investments longer. It's not just going to bonds or cash and going away. They're actually still managing it and they need to because they have such a longer lifespan. They need that money to last that long time. So it affects all different types of areas. Uh, you know, travel and leisure, travel more. You see more people look at the reason cruises are sold out for the next year is because older demographic tends to like cruises. They have money. They're more they're in better health, able to travel. That's why cruise lines. What were some of the best performing stocks of this year? Cruise lines, folks. You know, Carnival Cruise started eight bucks a share, hit almost 20 earlier. It's down to 15.30 today, but started this year at that level. You're, you, you, there's trends. We cannot ignore those trends. So the last segment I talk about here, and this is a really exciting one, and this is a trend uh, that obviously I love, and you, you guys all know because I've talked about it a lot, and this is artificial intelligence in the healthcare space, and it kind of links to exactly what I just talked about with longevity. In 2022, according, according to Morgan Stanley, 5.5% of the budget of healthcare companies uh, was dedicated to artificial intelligence. They think next year, so in two years, one year from today, two years from 2022, that uh, will hit 10.5%. AI companies will spend 10.5% um, of, of their money uh, on research and development, everything that goes with artificial intelligence. And that's not going to stop anytime soon, in my opinion. Uh, there's another study that showed that 94% of healthcare companies employ at least some form of artificial intelligence, machine learning, but only 24% of medical device companies use artificial intelligence, machine learning. So there's a big opportunity there. So there was a, a great study they put out. Uh, this case came out this weekend and, and I wanted to talk about it. Um, but according to uh, Morgan Stanley, there's kind of four areas within the healthcare trend. One is life sciences, uh, tools and diagnostics. Other one's medical technology. One's biopharma. And a third is healthcare services and technology. So I kind of wanted to break some of these down and, and give you some ideas of what we're talking about here. In the life sciences tools and diagnostics, this can be genomic data. Uh, we talk about genomics a lot, medical imaging, uh, and other things to do with basically your, your health records. Um, as you know, I go to longevity clinic every 12 to 18 months. I'm actually going in about two weeks, week and a half, uh, week and a half. Uh, back to New York City for my mid-year checkup uh, to see how I'm doing. Uh, and I'll, I'll definitely write about that. I love writing about it and share some stuff here in a podcast of what, what, what we do. Uh, but there's some areas within that that I think artificial intelligence will be huge for. Within the medical technology portion of it, um, this is focused more on the early uh, stages of care. And again, 
kind of what I do with longevity clinic, but also uh, CGM, which is continuous glucose monitoring. You see a lot of people have the things on their arm. Glucose is monitored continually. That's changed uh, the life of diabetics over the last decade or so. Uh, then you have cardiac monitoring. You know, you can eventually put a little chip in there, keep an eye on your heart if you have heart disease, uh, even your brain. You know, you have, you have uh, Elon Musk and Neuralink. So there's a lot of different things looking in. Uh, this is, again, more, uh, more like to help detect, um, to recommend treatments. And it just continually monitors your body. I love it. I've always said I'd be the first one to put a chip in everything and monitor my body. I'm big on health. I like to know how different things affect my body. Uh, there's biopharma, which is kind of biotech and pharma, pharmaceuticals combined. That is drug discovery. We talked about AI and drug discovery many times, uh, how it will take uh, clinical development, the manufacturing of it, um, the engagement you have with your physician. And again, there's three things this really does. It cuts down the development timeline from give or take 10 years now, I think once it's fully implemented in a decade, it's down to two years, three years maybe. Uh, cuts the expenditures. R&D, if you cut down time, obviously cuts it down. And you cut out a lot of other garbage to spend money on when you have AI machine learning doing that for you behind the scenes. Uh, and then you have, of course, the most important thing here uh, is uh, higher success rates and a lot less money to develop new drugs. Morgan Stanley said that uh, in 2021, uh, out of uh, uh, more than 100 marketing applications for drugs, uh, use some type of AI machine learning uh, up from only 14 uh, in the year before 2020. This is really interesting. They say every 2.5% improvement in preclinical development success, the success, preclinical trials to bring a drug to market, 2.5% improvement, it's not a lot of improvement. We'll add 30 additional new drug approvals over 10 years, give or take three years. But you get the five, you get, what's it, 5%? That's 60 new drugs. And I think it, it's going to improve much more than that. So the amount of new drugs hitting is going to be absolutely mind blowing. The last is health services and technology. Um, this talks, talks about, you know, shorten the time to detect um, and diagnose disease. And again, I think this is extremely important. And uh, just last week, the largest for profit um, hospital out there, which is HCA Healthcare, which is symbol HCA. They have a deal uh, that they just uh, signed with Google Cloud, and they're going to use the generative AI technology that Google has, and uh, they're going to use this for time-consuming tasks such as clinical documentation in their hospitals. This, to me, is something that should have been done for a decade. We've had a lot of this technology. You go to a doctor, you go to some of these hospitals, they're still writing things down with paper. You should be able to walk in, scan your name, and have all your medical records connected to everybody here in the United States that you want them connected to. I know HIPAA is a big issue and, and it's down for that, but and back in July, uh, telehealth company, Teladoc, TDOC, which has been struggling, which we recommended years ago before the pandemic and locked in some big gains with that for subscribers. Uh, they're teaming up with Microsoft to use AI again for automation, clinical documentation, taking during virtual medical exams. This stuff should have been implemented many, many years ago, in my opinion. We're finally getting there. I've been saying for years that I believe that the healthcare industry is one of the most antiquated behind everything else out there. Another one is transportation. We're finally starting to see EVs and autonomous come forward. But when it comes to transportation and healthcare, transportation real quick, you still fill up your gas with most of your cars, same way you did 70 years ago. When it comes to uh, healthcare, a lot of times you still fill out in pen the same darn way that you did decades ago. Granted, put in computer now, they have computers decades, many decades ago, but still the waste of time is just mind blowing to me. We need to get more efficient. And it's going to be better for patients, doctors, insurance companies, everybody. So some real big things going on right now. Again, just to recap, where we got markets, as I mentioned, big week last week, pulling back to start the week here today. We're flat where we were before, down about four tenths percent in the S&P 500. We had the big IPO coming out. Arm would be the biggest IP of the year here in the United States. Oil hitting highest level since last November. Housing bubble, I don't see it, folks. I think there's a lot of great investments off that. We're doing a lot of research on my team right now. We're going to release some health, or sorry, some housing related stocks, uh, some recommendations in the coming months as we dive into that. And then there's longevity, AI, healthcare all coming together. This will be one of the biggest investment themes of the next 10 to 20 years. The future of healthcare, how it's going to change dramatically. Next five, 10, 20 years. You need to be positioned in these stocks now, right now. So, all right, folks, hope you enjoyed the show. Hope you had a great long Labor Day weekend. You're back to work. You're probably a little tired today. Maybe you had a couple of beers yesterday. It's all right. Got a short four-day week. We'll be back Thursday with one of my frequent guests, colleague of mine, good friend of mine, Brett Eversall. 
from True Wealth Systems. He's the editor over there. We're going to be talking about the market right now, why he is also bullish, and some amazing stats and things we need to think about when we're looking to invest right now in the stock market. All that more coming up on Thursday. But again, thanks so much for watching. Until then, I'm Matt McCall, and this was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.